Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, bipedalism in humanity creeps back further in time, a lonely planet's mass is determined for the first time ever, a study on protecting albatross has some suggestions, and much more. Not much more, one more. More. Before we get started this week, at the end of the episode, Ben and I have some predictions for the year ahead, so be sure to stick around and see what we think might happen in the science world in 2026. And stick around until the end of the year to see if we're right. Our top story this week is a fascinating paper presenting new evidence for the oldest known example of a bipedal hominin. This hominin is a species that was first named in 2002, called Sahelanthropus chadensis, which lived approximately 7 million years ago in what is now the central African country of Chad. Sahelanthropus was initially known only from skull material, which was argued by researchers to support the idea that this hominin was capable of walking upright, mainly because of the orientation of the major opening at the base of the skull, through which the spinal cord passes, which was consistent with an upright stance. Other lines of evidence include the anatomy of the bony labyrinth of the inner ear, which appears consistent with an animal that was occasionally bipedal, and analyses of the overall structure of the cranium have found it to be grouped with fossil hominins rather than modern great apes. However, although the initial publication featured only the skull of Sahelanthropus, it was later discovered that some limb bones had also been uncovered with the specimen, though they had become mixed with other material. In 2020, another team published an initial description of the limb bones, finding that they were not consistent with those of a biped, but were instead more similar to those of chimpanzees. Hence, they considered Sahelanthropus to be primarily quadrupedal. But then, in 2022, another team argued that the limb bones were more consistent with the animal being occasionally bipedal. A few other studies have been published since, but overall, the recent research on Sahelanthropus has been rather polarised and contradictory, with some supporting this primate as being probably bipedal and hence potentially the earliest known hominin, while others have maintained that it was not bipedal, and therefore questioned whether it can really be classified as a hominin at all. This new addition to the Sahelanthropus story is a study that has found that, although the limb bones are most similar in size and overall shape to those of chimpanzees, their relative proportions are, in fact, more like those of a hominin. Additionally, the study reports the presence of two features linked to a hominin style of hip anatomy and knee function, as well as the presence of a specific raised ligament attachment point that has so far been only identified in bipedal hominins. As a result, the study concludes that Sahelanthropus was an early biped that evolved from a chimp-like ancestor. It would have had a rather unique form of bipedalism though, very different from that of modern humans and even from other ancient hominins, suggesting considerable diversity in walking styles among prehistoric hominins. However, as always, we could really do with a lot more fossils to test these hypotheses further and develop an improved understanding of these animals. It will be interesting to see what comes next in the Sahelanthropus story, and I'm sure this won't be the end of the discussion. In other paleontology news, a new study has confirmed that the ammonites, the famous coil-shelled cephalopods that lived during the time of the dinosaurs, actually survived the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous that wiped out the non-bird dinosaurs. At least for a little while. These iconic animals have long been considered textbook examples of victims of this extinction, but at some localities around the world, ammonites that appear to have lived into the first stage of the Paleogene period have been discovered. However, the idea that ammonites might have survived into the Paleogene has been considered controversial, as some of these fossils may have been reworked from older sediments, becoming reburied in younger sediments and, therefore, appearing to come from these rocks when they are actually older. 
This new work focuses on a site in Denmark, and through careful analysis of the fossils, it confirms that they are not reworked specimens and really did live and die during the Paleogene, after the mass extinction had occurred. This is an absolutely fascinating revelation, prompting the question of what actually killed the last of the Ammonites, given that some of them survived the end Cretaceous event. Some really cool news from the stars now, as the mass of a free-floating exoplanet has been measured for the first time. Free-floating planets are exceedingly rare, or at least it's exceedingly rare that we detect them. They are, perhaps unsurprisingly, planets not bound to any star, roaming the galaxy alone and unbound. Because they have no star, it's very difficult to actually see them, so we have to use a process referred to as gravitational microlensing. What we observe here is basically the effect that the planet's gravity has on light emitted from other objects when that planet passes in front of them. We've been able to discover these rogue planets thanks to gravitational microlensing, so it's great that this method does exist, but it does have its drawbacks. We're not usually able to work out the distance or mass of the planet using microlensing, but this paper has found a way around this hitch. This microlensing event was detected simultaneously by ground-based observatories and ESA's Gaia telescope, which is in space. By analysing the differences between the timings of these observations, the authors behind the study were able to calculate the mass of this exoplanet, which they believe to be similar to the mass of Saturn. A fascinating event in the study of some of the most lonely objects in our galaxy. Also in the news this week, an international study has identified a promising approach that could prevent thousands of unnecessary seabird deaths each year. Large numbers of seabirds are killed annually when they become hooked or entangled while foraging behind commercial fishing vessels. Longline fisheries alone are responsible for an estimated 50,000 to 75,000 seabird deaths every year, with a substantial proportion of these losses occurring in the Southern Ocean. One species facing particular pressure is the Antipodean albatross, which breeds only on small islands in New Zealand. Its numbers are declining by around 6% per year, largely due to bycatch in high seas fisheries. To better understand when and where these interactions occur, researchers tracked the movements of 192 Antipodean albatrosses using satellite transmitters. The data revealed that bycatch risk is not evenly spread across the ocean. Instead, it is concentrated in specific regions, with the highest risk occurring during the winter in the southern hemisphere. The study also showed that oceanography plays a key role in shaping these patterns. Features such as thermal fronts, areas of turbulent mixing and ocean eddies help concentrate marine life, attracting both seabirds searching for food and fishing vessels targeting productive waters, increasing the likelihood of overlap. The researchers argue that incorporating these ocean features into fisheries management could dramatically improve seabird protection. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Before we end this episode, as mentioned earlier, we thought it might be fun to make some predictions for what we think this next year of science may bring. So, what do I reckon is going to happen in 2026? Well, there's going to be lots of Mars news. That's always a safe bet. I think we're going to see Blue Origin ramp up its new Glenn program as it tries to genuinely compete with SpaceX's Falcon 9. Speaking of SpaceX, I'm sure we'll see many exciting tests of Starship as it prepares to be ready for the Artemis 3 crewed mission to the Moon, currently scheduled for next year. The James Webb Space Telescope will probably make more discoveries about the edge of space and time, and I reckon we'll get some traction on the stories from Desi and Friends this year about dark energy potentially not being a cosmological constant, which could potentially be a massive physics story. And Finally, from me, the archaeological gold mine of Pompeii will yield something truly amazing this year. I'm not the only one with predictions this year, though, so let's see what Ben thinks might happen in the paleontology news of 2026. First of all, he reckons that some kind of previously giant prehistoric animal will be getting a downsize. That's a fairly safe bet as well. He also thinks there's going to be some more Spinosaurus controversy and probably some questioning of the validity of Nanotyrannus lithaeus, because of course the Nanotyrannus wars can't be over just yet. 
Also, because it happened so many times last year, he also thinks we may have some more fossil human bones being realised to have come from Denisovans. Also, we'll probably get another theropod dinosaur with strange forelimbs, considering how many of those were described last year. You can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons including Andrew Cowam, Brain Weevil, Kang Yin, Chippy Chippy Chapa Chapa, Dean A. Bather, Diana Hernandez, Drevshri Vastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, Irage, Joran Joydevic, John French, Joseph Ree, Josh Lambert, Joshua, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Nikolaus York, Ralph Balzac, Robert Prietbrzega Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Petrikas, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedro, Tracy Merrifield, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.